we might start. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Um, on behalf of our chair, Chris Freeman, and our trustees, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for this discussion. Um, firstly, let me acknowledge the, the, the uh, let me acknowledge the ownership of the traditional land. Oh, now I've stuffed that up completely. Let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. This afternoon is an ongoing discussion for us here at QPAC around public value. Um, can I thank Steve, Steve Austin and the ABC? The ABC have been great neighbours since they've been in the precinct and I think the decision to bring them into the precinct has been wonderful for all of us. So Steve, thank you for being here. Professor Moore, thank you again for um, visiting us. Professor Moore, I'll speak about him more in a second, but um, is one of the preeminent thinkers in the world at the moment and I think it's great that he's actually given us some of his time. Um, Dr. Jeff Wilcock, thank you very much, Jeff, for being here. And Professor Judith McLean, Judith, thank you for being here. Um, the discussion of public value for us at QPAC began um, some time ago, but really came into sharp focus when Mark vi visited us a year ago. It has strongly influenced our new strategic plan and it has made has been a major driver in terms of the planning conversations that we have here in at QPAC. So I'm not holding QPAC up as the role model, I'm just using it as my kind of current experience. One of the major things to talk about it is that there is no beginning and end to this conversation. It's a journey in how we generate public value. It underpins our strategic plan. And the third thing I was particularly told to tell you is the most important thing that we need to get into is how we measure it. But I'll let the experts talk about that. The preeminent panel this afternoon begins with Professor Moore. Mark is at one time the chair of two parts of Harvard, so we're very lucky to have Mark here. He is the Hauser Chair for Nonprofit Organisations at the Hauser Institute of Civil Society at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Mark, again, thank you. And he divides his time because he was just recently appointed as the Herbert A. Simons Professor of Education in the Management and Organisational Behaviour at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard as well. Professor Moore describes his work at both schools at Harvard as helping students figure out how to produce system level change and to help them become either as social entrepreneurs or social change makers. I think that's something we can all relate to. Jeff, on the other hand, is a senior research fellow at the Wesley Mission, Brisbane, and is an adjunct associate professor in Griffith Un University School of Human Services um, and Social Work. Jeff's an, a common face here at QPAC and part of the common conversation that we have in terms of helping us define who we are and going forward. And our third speaker, Professor Judith McLean, is our scholar in residence and that position is a co-funded position between us and QUT. Before I hand over to Steve to actually manage and, um, and drive the conversation, I'll invite Judith to say a few words that'll help set the context um, for this afternoon's conversation. But two housekeeping things I should say to you, that this conversation, th this debate is being um, streamed. So we'd encourage as many questions as you want. And the way to participate in those is to come up to the mic and actually speak into the mic. It just helps us to actually get the word out. And then secondly, the Twitter feed address will come up on the screens at some time. And if you feel you, that you want to participate in that conversation, I really encourage you to do that. So um, relax, enjoy us for the next hour and a half to two hours, and we'll hand over to Steve. But firstly, thank you, Judith. Good afternoon, uh, Chris Freeman, a Chair of the QPAC Board, the Trustees of the QPAC Board, <coughs> Chief Executive John Kotsis and the Executive Staff of QPAC. Uh, my other boss, Prof Professor Rod Whistler, who's the Executive Dean at Creative Industries and esteemed colleagues, one and all. Good afternoon. Um, as John said, it's absolutely wonderful to have Professor Moore back and uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion that we did begin 12 months ago. Um, it is wonderful to have a public intellectual of Mark's stature to think with us about arts and culture and measurement 
And um, if you hear me saying and a lot, you'll know it's because um, I'm a fan of the ampersand. I'm a fan of um, multiplicity and I rage against essentialness. So in the 10 minutes that I have, I want to uh, discuss three areas. Some general remarks about Australian culture and the arts and public value and society's relationship, some would call it a fetish with measurement. Initially, I'll pose six questions that I hope will spark discussion later on the panel. I'll outline how QPAC has grappled with theory and the application of public value over the past 12 months. We'll show you our value. Um, however, I want to be clear from the outset that QPAC's story is not being presented as any kind of hero narrative on the subject of public value. It's simply a story, the story that il illustrates one organisation's approach. And I'll finish with a quote about the dangers of not engaging with public value in the long term. So to begin, I want to refer to a landmark speech around national culture and arts policy delivered by Professor Julianne Schultz in August this year. Julianne, as you know, has cha was chair of the previous federal government's reference group that considered public submissions from all over the country to a proposed national cultural policy. Her speech is an important one. To summarise, she says this. In a noisy, cluttered world, we all take shortcuts. Things get done in the same way over and over with few variations. But times change. So the challenge is to get the frame right because unless and until it's done, there'll be a mismatch between, between problem and solution. Her comments are apposite concerning arts and culture and public value and measurement. What are the frames we look through? Who sets the frames? And what values are inherent within these frames? She offers six lessons gleaned from the extensive consultation. And I've gone on to pose these as possible mit mismatches between frame, problem, and hopefully um, that we could talk about some of the solutions this afternoon. First, she challenges our perception of culture and the arts. She argues that in the past, culture and the arts have been conceptualized as the glue that bonds and bridges people, places, and ideas. Whilst this is true, culture and arts today play a much larger industry slash sector role, and we can discuss whether it's an industry or a sector. She states, the cultural sector is valued at $48.6 billion of GDP and rising. However, it is structurally disaggregated, embedded in different sectors in different ways. She suggests we're not having the impact we could be having in the public domain and that the business of the sector often tends to be invisible and to go unnoticed. So, problem one, how do we tell the whole story of the arts and culture's public value in Australia? Second problem, participation in culture and the arts is a human right. Australia is signed up to multiple international conventions. Human rights are not optional extras. They're not gifts to be granted or withheld. Problem two, how do we activate and celebrate arts and culture as a human right? Third, governments, whatever they may think, do not make culture. In the best of circumstances, they provide it through strategy, policy, strategic intervention and regulatory frameworks. Governments do not operate commercially. They also operate to create public value. Problem three, how do we ensure that public value a value is not conflated as commercial value in the arts and culture. Fourth, culture is not solely the domain of those sectors of government dedicated to the arts. It intersects with education, ind indigenous affairs, communication, foreign affairs, tourism, and on and on and on. Problem four, how do we aggregate culture and the arts to get a true picture of the impact across the nation? Fifth, culture is complex and multifaceted. It's hard to measure, but not impossible. 
And as an aside, putting my board member hats on, I would, arg I would argue that unreliable quantitative multiples accepted as truth are just as dangerous as simplistic qualitative claims of measurement. Problem five, does measurement equal accountability? Six, measurement is important and we need to get past the bit that feels uncomfortable and unknowable and be more ambitious about measuring the value of culture so we simply don't rely on proxies such as ticket sales and number of visitors. Problem six, how do we identify and describe appropriate measures of public value that reflect what we are trying to achieve and how we're doing it? If we can agree that these frames will assist us in what the philosopher Foucault says in Thinking Other, it may be possible to find new ways to conceive of and articulate new conversations about public value and measurement. This leads me to the public value and QPAC, to public value and QPAC. QPAC has th three clear roles as set out in legislation. As a presenter of art, a leader in arts learning, and a manager of a performing arts venue. A year ago, Professor Moore came to QPAC. We took on his notion of the public value strategic triangle as a way to think, in a more deep, to think more deeply about our relationships with ourselves and with our communities. His model, like any great model, is elegantly simple, urging clarity of thinking between re the relationship of authorising agencies and organisational compa uh, capacity and the public value implicit and explicit within these triangular relationships. There was, of course, already a suite of indicators and measures that were monitored and helped to assess success at QPAC, and naturally these measures responded to strategic reporting requirements of the government. It's important to state that QPAC was coming off the success of four and five years of growth and expansion, so it wasn't coming from a deficit position. But there was something missing. A more expansive narrative needed to be told that linked QPAC's value across and between and amongst the three of those roles. What Professor Moore's work offered was a language that promoted a different kind of conversation, a way to start talking across the whole organisation. The language of public value was integrated into the strategic planning process and it became cross-organisational, cross-disciplined and iterative. Where the fuller narrative began to emerge was when all the parts of the business were clarified and daily activities outlined in terms of public value. This was when the narrative changed. The conversation began to connect aims, objectives, outputs, outcomes, measures of success and the day-to-day -day roles of staff and our stakeholders and the connecting the overall business of the centre with our public. It was in amongst the whole value chain that the story became real. In saying this, it may seem like some disconnected technical process. Indeed, it was anything but. A cross-organisational, cross-discipline and iterative process meant that staff involved brought their biases and their vulnerabilities with them. This was a fully embodied exercise which was at times really challenging and really demanding and one at times, uh, it was very difficult, let me say, at times. What we arrived at was four discrete but interconnected areas of focus. Now, as I say, this is something that all organisations do and I'm not claiming it, we are not claiming it, Rebecca um, Lemoyne, who led this process as head of strategy. But here's where we ended up. So what we became clear about were our focus areas. And the first was the programs of QPAC, how we curate and curate became the word that we used to distinguish this focus so that we make mindful choices and achieve meaningful outcomes. This was, as I've said, a difficult conversation given QPAC's multiple roles as producer, presenter, investor and venue for hire. The second is the experience focus. How can we create multidimensional experiences that work with, attract, captivate, and uh, work together with local people and visitors. 
The third focus is learn, connecting people, ideas and content. The goal here is artistic and civic literacy for our staff, our audiences and the wider public. And the fourth focus is sustain, building a coalition of support and practices that enable growth and vitality. This includes financial and organisational resources as well as partnerships. By all the talking, arguing and synthesis, what we arrived is, is that public value and measurement can be examined at every part of the value chain and that to confine it to outputs in economic terms can never tell or be the full story. The value of measurement and its impact was told when conceived of as a holistic process. Do we do what we claim to do? For whom and how does it enrich the communities we work with? In looking ahead at how we can continue to add public value through engagement in the measurement narrative, I want to pose a further reframe and subsequent problem. With the introduction of big data that we're all grappling with, what role can the acquittal process play in answering questions one to six? If we're to have more inclusive measurements, we need to match this with different types of acquittals. Acquittals are always rushed, overlooked or done badly, focusing on narrow measures. We don't move beyond, did we spend the money that we said we were going to spend? What if we used arts and cultural leaders um, who took on a development role to work in the acquittal area? I'm arguing for a rethink around this important phase that positions the process as a site of stakeholder learning rather than a site of proof. So, three more reframes to bring the number to 10 and then I'll stop. What are the new questions that might emerge from sites of stakeholder learning rather than sites of proof? What might the role of expert in leading new development opportunities about public value and measurements in the sector be? And finally, how might we measure the whole rather than a slice? I'll finish by quoting Professor, Professor Ross Garno, who offers a salutary warning about failing to take public value seriously. He warns against a new political culture that elevates private over public interests and the immediate over the longer term. If we continue within the political culture, he says we'll live in greater comfort for a short while, but sooner rather than later, we'll experience deep economic recession with high unemployment. We recognise it already in some places. We can expect bitter conflict within our society and unhappiness about our institutions. Thank you. ABC 612 Steve Austin um, will now lead us into discussion about those and many other ideas, I'm sure. Peter, thanks very much. If you're watching on the stream in the office, get back to work. Uh, and if you're at home, like the Arts Minister is on holidays, uh, you can contribute to dis today's discussion. Uh, the Twitter handle is at QPAC, and the hashtag, if you'd like to send it out, is uh, hashtag public value. I'm going to give both uh, Mark and Jeff a, a quick opportunity up front to just sort of state their position in a couple of minutes, uh, for a couple of minutes, and then we'll sort of start drilling down into uh, some of the issues. Uh, Mark Moore, the Australian Bureau of Statistics says that in Australia, the federal government, uh, which sends the money out to states, by the way, goes, gets their hand and puts it in the back pocket of a hotel owner in Maryborough or a hotel owner in Fremantle on the other side of the country and takes that money out and puts it in a pocket to give to this mob here. <laughs> Seven billion dollars every year mm -hmm. and all they want to know is where the money's gone. <laughs> and it's called a fetish uh, about accountability. Mm -hmm. So let me just get you to state up front, what are some of the, the challenges that our guests have for measuring and communicating where that money went. Okay, well, I think uh, at the outset, this is a tough one, the way you phrased it, because it raises Literally. the distributional issue about whether we're taking from area A and delivering benefits in area B. So I'd prefer to set that question aside for a minute and deal with the more direct question of whether expenditures in A for the benefit of a, uh, a given geographic area would produce B and what it is that we can say about B. Is that, a, is that okay, acceptable okay, to you? Okay. Ignore my question. All right, yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the first, it's the first thing I learned how to do, actually. Uh, in you are in the School of Government. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think the critical question is this question about um, 
we make expenditures for arts, and the question is, is what do, and we do that out of taxpayer dollars, right, and uh, through the use of state authority. What is it that uh, the public gets in return for that? Uh, and that's the, basically the question of public value. And I'm tempted to, I was quite taken by Judith's idea that um, this is a, uh, an occasion that comes up over and over again in government where um, all public organizations are asked to give an account of what it is that they've done uh, with the dollars that we've entrusted to them and with the authority that we've in, entrusted to them as well. And what I like about the idea of an account is that it, it means one meaning of the word account is I give a story mm -hmm. or I try to explain uh, what it is that I thought we were doing and why it was valuable. And in telling that story, I try to inspire, I try to show people a vision and stuff like that. And the other meaning of the word account is I have some numbers here that registered a series of actual effects that occurred in the world and they were assembled in something that could be called the account of what happened and it includes a recognition of the costs that were expended as well as a uh, set of effects that occurred in the uh, world as a consequence of that. And I think that what's challenging about public value accounting is in some sense to get those two things lined up together. There has to be both a story that uh, captures uh, philosophically what we had in mind, all right, and then a rather rigorous e empirical demonstration of the degree to which uh, that aspiration was actually captured in what it is that we were trying to do. And it seems to me that if you fail to attend to either of those, then you leave our, we leave our public and the people that we're accountable to uh, in a situation where they can neither understand nor call to account nor think and learn. Uh, and so one of the interesting challenges about constructing a public value framework, as Judith described it, for the arts, is that we should anticipate, it seems to me, that that's going to be a continuing conversation that goes at, at uh, four different levels, you might think about it. One is the technical level, how we're gonna measure it. The next would be the managerial level, which is can we use this set of measures to uh, both um, guide allocation decisions and animate uh, higher levels of performance with respect to the organizations. And then there's the political level, which is can the measures actually speak to uh, the values that the uh, politicians and our elected representatives wanted to see produced in the organization. And that means they'd like to see a certain amount of economic development impact, that's one thing. They say we'd like to see a certain amount of community impact and the uh, mobilization of increased tolerance in our community, that would be another thing. And then ultimately there's this quest philosophical question of well, now that we've had a chance to think about all this together and try to construct an account, could we say once again what it is that we thought we were doing when we decided to support uh, the arts and uh, what is it that we had in mind? And can we name those things and then could we also uh, in naming those things, imagine a, an event that would happen in the world that would reveal uh, the degree to which that uh, aspiration had been reliably uh, produced, right? And could we count up the number of those events that had happened so that we could connect uh, the technical account uh, that we have to do for reasons of both accountability and learning and with the account, uh, the story uh, that is the story, the normative and philosophical story of value creation that links the kind of society we want to be to the things that we're doing right at the moment with our hard-earned tax dollars to try to create that. Jeff Woolcock, let me give you a couple of minutes. Uh, the difficulties, some of the challenges faced with measuring and communicating value from your view. Mm. I'll, add, I'll try to answer your question right on the money, Steve. But, um, and, and you asked us to sort of state our position and just using Mark's scenario that he kind of painted, as a series of events that build up a narrative, that tell a story, that in, in the end have some measurability, whether that's in numbers or not. I mean, that's my, my most formative experience, as it was for anyone who went through that period in, in, in this country, was uh, the whole decade, 1990s, in HIV AIDS, in social research at the community sector level, where the combination of events was ultimately trying to tell the one story about reducing, at that stage, obviously, a terminal disease. and. Uh, it, it, there were a lot of means justifying the ends, but uh, you had to have a, you had to confront that value, as we all know, with how sensitive an, an issue still is, uh, um, but it was at the time because of its prevalence. Mm -hmm. um, so that's had a, a big impact on me. Um, it's translated in more recent, or certainly in the last decade, to being work, working in all areas, I guess, of where there's disadvantage and work now for a big, NGO, not-for-profit, that, that works essentially in the area of disadvantage. I still hold on to sometimes a bit of a romantic notion that most people still live in a, a community, perhaps these days less mediated by place, 
but still uh, identify with um, one or usually more than one um, community and that, that there is, we are a collective species and that we need to have measures that, again, reflect that and ask us that question. But it, um, again, in stating positions, I guess what's always attracted me about this, because I'm by no means a, a statistician, I would never want to call myself that in the social research or social scientist, I suppose I'd have to be tagged, but it's an interest really in that fundamental question that we've had since the beginning of civilization to take it right back to its philosophical roots about what is progress. I mean, that, that, that is the heart of this whole debate that has been for thousands of years. So, so does art and culture tell the story of that progress and can you measure it simply? I don't think you can measure it no. simply. <laughs> well, I think you can... Because you're heading towards outcomes, aren't you, because of the people you work with. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think if you can frame it in, a, in, a, in one that's a values-driven thing and not a, a measurement-oriented thing, and I think when Judith or um, Julianne talks of measurement fetish, I think that's part, part of the, the, the distortion out of that fetish is that we still let uh, our me measurements guide the value discussion rather than the other way around. Judith, um, John Berger, art critic, wrote ways of seeing that capitalism requires us to define our interests in as narrowly as possible. Uh, and I assume Julian Schultz is saying this is absolutely dominating our thinking now. Uh, that, that it's all about the money, it's the show me the money for us to show us the value. How do you defeat uh, that narrowly defined uh, section of interest? Yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer to that, and if I did, um, you know, I'd be employed by every arts company in the world, I think. Um, I, yes, I think it's absolutely right that it, it's a balancing act. To go back to your question about the $7 billion, if I can just answer that first of all, I think it's interesting when you work across a number of sectors. For example, does education, what kinds of proof does education actually um, have to present? What kind of health? Do, uh, what kind of proof does the health sector actually have to prove? And I think um, not to become defensive, but I think it's up to us to find measures, and be they uh, numerical measures or be they narrative measures, that are persuasive mm. and uh, can win arguments really in terms of those people that um, use the public money and. Um, I don't think the answer is to do that narrowly. I think, you know, as Julianne says, one of the things is that the arts and culture work across so many domains and what we haven't done is we haven't gathered that together to tell the whole story. So... Um, QPAC has a board. Sophie Mitchell, Chris Freeman, others on the board, they can add up. They can read a balance sheet. They understand money. And we're going to call John Kotsis in. Say, John, we gave you all this money. Where's the return? And he can say, well, I can tell you we did this amount of ticket sales, this many people saw the shows, uh, and sort of give the basic accounting argument that, that, that Mark observed. But then they want to know what the multiplier yes. is, the add-on. And I think Mark is heading towards the add-on is the cultural story. Yeah. Uh, do you want to address that at all? And it'll come back to Mark. Oh, oh, Mark, sorry. Okay. Sorry, you could start with a cultural story that, uh, that picked up an economic narrative, right? Mm. And said, uh, once we'd satisfied ourselves that the QPAC had uh, a, uh, yielded a significant financial return on the uh, property that it holds uh, in trust for the state, once we could demonstrate that uh, each of its uh, performances made some money, uh, and once we could demonstrate that it had had an effect on the industry that uh, allowed the industry to grow and brought tourism dollars into the state, right? We could have one essentially set of numbers that said from an economic narrative where we're imagining that value is associated with financial performance of a variety of different types, here's how we've done, right? Then there's the next question, which is, and any, I suppose any reasonable board would want to be sure that that was true and also, by the way, make sure that uh, uh, they'd stayed within the state budget that they'd been offered and, and et cetera. But it seems to me that the question of public value, so let's, let's call all of those things that I just described um, public value one or private value, right? And the reason I want to call it public value one and or private value is because I want to acknowledge that, um, you know, the public has an interest in economic development. It has an interest in uh, having the performance of its uh, uh, government be financially uh, capable. And frankly, uh, one of the ways that we can measure the value of the art is the 
the number of people who showed up and flunk their money down to see the show. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's nothing wrong with any of those measures. There's nothing particularly offensive about any of those measures. They're mm -hmm. part of a story of value creation that's worth attending to. I think the challenge of public value is whether there's a concept of public value too, right, that goes above and beyond that particular set of measures uh, and that then asks the question, uh, so how did QPAC or its associate agencies do with respect to that? And that's where things get uh, a little bit more complicated because now we start have to name things that we thought would be socially valuable that it would emerge from a healthy arts uh, sector that would benefit the society as a whole, right? And then we could start with the idea that people have a right to participate in art, and, but of course, that's nothing new. There's a question then about whether they have a right to demand a government payment for participation in the arts, and uh, the answer is, well, you know, I don't know very many liberal societies that have decided that uh, once I appointed myself an artist that I was entitled to a government grant, but I do know many societies in which such programs exist, and after you've done a certain amount of work on your own and celebrated the fact, then you get one of these things, but that's so, uh, but there might be a more important idea, which is that um, there's something about not just, and this is really the important part, not just about the consumption of art, but about the production of it, all right, and the sponsoring of it, as in addition to the consumption of it, that it's an important experience for human beings to have, that it's uh, something that we would associate with a social goal that you could describe as human flourishing as well as human welfare. And the idea of human flourishing would include not only that we can eat and sh have shelter and stuff like that, but somehow or other that we fully experience what it meant to be a human being in the company of other human beings. And that the production of art uh, and the sponsorship of art might be an important part of the kind of human flourishing that we would uh, like to have available to or make ha in, in support in a population because that's part of what it meant to live with uh, in the society. Uh, and I assume that that the good news about that is that we don't have to do an awful lot to guarantee that that's going to happen because people are going to do that on their own, right? But then the interesting question is, is could we create an enabling environment in which more of that happened and it produced uh, a deeper sense of yourself as a human being and all that sort of stuff and that we could sort of capture that. Now you could then go beyond that and sort of say uh, the experience of producing and consuming art might in a variety of ways make us better citizens, not just as uh, economic producers, uh, but also as um, people who were good neighbors. Uh, you mean social cohesion? Social Public value is social cohesion. Yeah, although I think the social cohesion is a little bit dangerous because it sounds as though uh, it causes us all to be the same. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to yes. call it social homogeneity. <laughs> I would prefer to call it uh, social cohesion where we could recognize the extraordinary differences among us. And instead of feeling threatened by that, feel as though we were fully competent as human beings to uh, accept that as a uh, condition of our uh, life and what it means to be a human being, and that that could then shape both our civic culture and our political culture in a way that would make democracy itself possible. Because I don't think, actually, I, I think one of the pieces of evidence that's becoming very clear from this throughout the world is that you can have democratic institutions but not have a democratic polity, right? Uh, and that those, that doesn't work out very well. And so the real challenge is how can we have both a democratic polity and a democratic set of institutions. And I think one of the important things to think about is the way in which uh, the experience, not only of consuming art, but of producing it, uh, would turn out to create a uh, civic and a political culture that was a much more attractive one in which to live. Now, it's, let me just say one more thing. I know I'm talking too great a length, but I don't think art is all that different in this respect than religion or sports no. or, uh, or, uh, or uh, charitable organizations that arrive or other kinds of voluntary associations. But it would be wrong for us to think that art wasn't one of those things, right, and that we didn't have a significant stake in the way that uh, arts organizations created opportunities for people to consume, produce, and sponsor art in a way that would cause them to become more fully human and more sociable as, uh, as citizens. Jeff Wilcox, on that social cohesion issue, Mission Australia, you run, mission a, a mission, oh, sorry, you, you run um, Arts for the Margins program, yes. and, and which gives homeless people uh, an artistic outlet uh, to show their work <laughs> and to receive monetary response from people who can buy it. Mm. Um, but as I understand, one of the, the, the problems is that homeless people are not being cohesively included with our society. Uh, they're being utterly shut out. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, utterly shut out of our, our culture. Now, is, is art from the margins, A, bringing them in, 
creating cohesion, Certainly. or is it simply highlighting the fact that we're not cohesive? Yeah, and both end, I think, um, is, mm -hmm. is the truth, because uh, the success of that program was obviously to be able to tap into into people's better hearts and, 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 and see the, the absolute innate logic and sense of it all and, and huge opportunities and growing all the time. But, but of course, then the reality of just, as we know in this part of the world, uh, how the visit of affordability of housing and how many barriers that are along the way. That takes away one, perhaps, at least in terms of giving people an outlet, cultural outlet. But I, just can I just pick up on also on Mark, where he was taking that argument and, and that notion of public value one being a more sort of economically driven one and then another set mm. of values. And I think one of the traps, and certainly I've seen it in the, in the cultural indicators and cultural values field, perhaps because it's been perceived, rightly or wrongly, to have come in a bit later than some of those arguments, is that it's had to sort of fight the argument on its own. Mm. And I think the real, mm. that s well certainly in real places where we see mm. much more integration, much more acceptance of, of a fundamental importance of culture in, in terms of our measures of how mm. we're going, it is where, not just because they might have started the argument earlier, but it's much more integrated sort of arguments, not feeling like it's we have to make a cause and effect argument all on our own. It's, mm. it's, 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 it's the logic of just being um, part, of, part of a whole society mm. with all those different influences. I mean, every survey that's been taken of Australians about what they value, they value a whole lot of things more than they do our GDP. Mm. Yeah. So that's right. <laughs> and uh, well, I really, just following on from that, um, there's no problem with metric values. You know, it's not either or, it's and, and, and. And I mean, I sit on the tourism board and I know some of my colleagues are here today. And uh, there are three criteria about which we um, measure or, or judge whether or not we will fund an event. And they are in return on investment. They are um, the public uh, uh, profiling of the event and what that does for the region and in tourism. And the third one is um, the sort of civicness around the event. And that's the one that we all have trouble measuring. That's the one that needs the work. That's what we're talking about here. And this is, this is you know, it, it is not we don't want to uh, measure from a metric point of view, but we want more. And we want to have those conversations that will impact. And I have to say, we are no different. As I said, I work in the health sector. And the health sector now has what they call activity-based funding. And it, it is about how many patients do you see and tick off, not whether the quality of the exchange between doctor and patient was a good exchange, it's rather what are the numbers. So we aren't fighting this alone. These kinds of debates are you know, multi-sectorial, to use a, an academic term. I can pick off of that one for a minute because in some ways it's ironic that the moment that we're uh, doing much better or thinking we're doing much better when we're measuring productivity from a supplier to a customer in the form of medicine, mm -hmm. which is um, you know, the quality and content and stuff mm -hmm. of that transaction. At the same time, we're realizing that uh, the production of sustained public value often requires a consistent engagement of the family uh, and then beyond the family, a supporting neighborhood mm -hmm. in order to allow uh, the individual patient uh, to recover, right, or to mm -hmm. maintain a certain mm -hmm. quality of health or something like that. And so there's a way in which the audience or the demander, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. where we think the value is being created mm -hmm. is uh, no longer the only object of our attention. It is increasingly all the people who are joined with the physician in uh, the uh, support or the, eff or the series of demands. It's mm -hmm. not just support, mm -hmm. it's also uh, look, honey, don't eat that roll, please. Uh, and eat only green meat or <laughs> only green meat. That's the kind I'm accustomed to getting. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a soy product, a green meat. Um, but I think the, the point is, is that um, so this picture we have of value coming at the end of a value chain in which there's a production process and a product or service gets delivered, and then the value is in the value that is attached to it by the person who uses it, which is the mm. standard model in a uh, product is not quite the right picture here Absolutely. because there's an awful lot of value in arts that's being produced when people are producing it with no audience. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can imagine that a uh, guy dancing all by himself mm. in his uh, uh, room or singing mm. in the shower, mm. Mm. right, is getting an awful lot of value out of, uh, mm. uh, of that experience, uh, but there's no audience there. Yeah, right? and Mark, can I interrupt there and just say that was the really the light bulb moment for us, that this is not just about audience, this is not just about the public, this is about the 700 people who work at QPAC. 
you know, there's value there, which really, you know, you sort of think of, but it, it was very forcibly, came from very forcibly to us. Can I Sorry pick up on interrupt. that point too, Jeeves, because uh, that's another, I think, a bit of an illusion about measurement fetish, and I, I like the term because of its, obviously, its value, and people were tweeting already as soon as you said it, but but it, there's a bit of an illusion that it's that it's it's all immediately embedded and widespread and everywhere. It's still largely a, an elite practice product uh, or, or a process of production about who who does those measures and who puts them out. And that's, measures, yeah. and that's yeah. I think that's a real problem. If there's any hallmark of the the global movement to sort of redefine progress mm -hmm. without trying making it sound too grand, it's it, at the heart of it is to make those measures themselves democratic. Mm -hmm. A lot of I mean, there'd be people in this room, I know, who would do similar exercises, and Mark, you might have done it with GPAC, but a visioning exercise where you paint, paint a mythical date 10, 20 years down the track, give them some fancy award, and then paint the scenario about what does the selection panel come to see and give you this magnificent award in the week that I do that exercise with so many different organisations, none of them ever actually say they see measures, they see numbers, they see indicators. Everyone paints a very visual picture, which is mm. terrific, but mm. it's interesting how no one ever says, I actually produced some just some good hardline data that showed we made this difference. Um, so it's still, <laughs> it's still segmented. That's, that's the motion when the, the two different ideas of an account are still divided. Right? Yeah. And I, I keep wanting to stress that the, the, those pieces have to be brought together so yeah. that the one speaks to the other. And one yeah. way to think about it is every time I give you a number, mm. I ought to be able to give you 10 stories that lie behind that number and show what that number means. Mm. And conversely, every time I tell you a story, mm. I ought to be able to say, and by the way, here's the number that says mm. how often that actually happened in the mm. world and it didn't just happen mm. once, mm. right? So there's a piece of me that's pretty hard-nosed on the idea of trying to get some uh, quantitative measures, but then on the other hand, I'm pretty soft on the question of uh, sort of where it is that we go to look for the creation of, uh, of value. And so mm. let me just take one more minute if I could. On mm. So there's a thing in, a, in the nonprofit sector, which I studied for a long time, there's a kind of enterprise that's called a member serving organization, all right? And it includes churches and it includes, um, and they often have a little charitable thing they do on the side, but fundamentally they're uh, or an ethnic group that's protecting its own interests and stuff like that. So the question then turns out to be, do they have what you could call producers and uh, employees and clients and customers and, the, and people who own the firm, right, which is the standard model we have of, you know, what a business enterprise mm -hmm. looks like. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that in those organizations, it's the same people, right? The people that are consuming whatever it is that the organization produces are members, the people who are producing it are members, mm. and the people who are owning it, it and guiding it and governing it are all members, all right? So then if you went to that world and you sort of say, well, I know where to find the value, it lies in the satisfaction of the people outside the organization who got the benefits, you'd look at that and say, really? I don't, they don't have anybody like that, so why does this organization exist, right? And the organization exists because it's creating something for the people, and they think of themselves as members of a, of a so an interesting, question that's really a wild one at some level and really blows your mind is to say, suppose that we thought that the right way to think about QPAC and the arts community was that we thought of it as a community that consisted of many members, right? And our goal was to get as many people to be members of that as possible, right? And to make sure that the members of that organization feel like the enterprise is going well in the yeah. sense that they're getting a chance to be both a sponsor of art and a producer of art and a uh, consumer of art. And that would be a very different picture. And just one other quick slide on that. But if you look at the art industry as a whole, uh, you'll see nonprofits, you'll see some government agencies, and then you'll see a lot of commercial stuff, right? But one of the interesting things is that in what we think of as the nonprofit piece, you'll see lots of what other, in other contexts would be described as small businesses, mm -hmm. right? So there are artists who are trying to make money out of being mm -hmm. artists, right? Mm -hmm. And the way they do that is they get a job, you know, performing for a serious arts organization, and they teach uh, music and uh, stuff on the side, and <laughs> uh, you know. And so there are all these little small entrepreneurs in the middle of what we often think of as the uh, nonprofit art sector. And just like uh, the economy has a large number of small businesses and stuff, and those often turn out to be important not only economically but socially in terms of anchoring particular areas and stuff like that. Geez, maybe that, uh, that you know, this, this thick community of people who are sort of taking in one another's laundry, right, 
is the right way to think about the uh, art sector so rather than um, big producers with big audiences and uh, big economic returns. Well, so those artists are actually entrepreneurs. That's, that would be the idea. Uh, and they're entrepreneurs both, and like many entrepreneurs, you know, many entrepreneurs want to be entrepreneurs that produce a big, huge international firm, and they end up doing a small business, right? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, the same thing happens here. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs who end up being a small business, and it turns out that they do a lot of the work of creating opportunities for to participate in art, and they make their own lives better because they chose an artistic life that they prefer to many other things, and all looks good to me. So QPAC and arts organizations like them are sponsoring or are growing entrepreneurs to become small business people. It's one possibility. I mean, if, if you ask yourself the question, I mean, if, if you wanted to stay in this public value one, which was the economic accounting, yes. right, and you wanted to ask uh, the question, so how much small business are we supporting, or how much is... Uh, are we creating context in which it could actually survive? And the way in which it survives is children go to see these big concerts and they get excited about it and their parents want them to be able to participate in it. And so they start spending their own money on a variety of different things. My bet is that that would be a big number uh, above and beyond what we're now sort of capturing. Uh, I mean, there are people in this room who are better qualified to speak about this. I, I know that we all know the Arts for All Queenslanders strategy has just been, you know, is in, in the atmosphere. And uh, I know that that's been a very um, uh, inclusive process. And I also know that what you're talking about um, is evidenced. And I don't know where the people are, but they will, I'm sure, ask a question about it. That there are many entrepreneurs. There are right. within the regions. There are, you know, and we need that undergrowth. We need that sort of, you know, in the in the ecosystem. Uh, if we don't have that. Uh, then, you know, we, we don't have a system, we don't have a sector, we don't have an industry, so. Th this would be the equivalent of the gyms and the uh, fitness clubs for the, uh, for the uh, sports sector, <laughs> right? Yeah. What's our equivalent of the uh, gyms and the uh, fitness clubs uh, for, uh, for the art sector, right? Mm. Uh, mm. Jim, can I ask you about public value too? Art often is, it has like a spiritual, art, art reveals the subconscious. Uh, it was um, Nick Cohen, the writer for The Guardian, who said uh, Marxists and Catholics have something in common. They both believe that art should say something. <laughs> uh, uh, and he's probably right. Mm -hmm. And it, there's, it has this, it's almost like a spirituality for the secular realm. How do you see it? So this takes us into two areas. It takes us into the whole area of neuroscience where we actually know now that, um, and, and, you know, please, neuroscientists in the room don't correct me because, but we know that there is a relationship between uh, the left brain and logio-deductive thinking <coughs> and the right brain or areas of the right hemisphere where an entirely different way of knowing exists in the world. And people will know it through meditation, will know it through, um, uh, you know, walking in the bush and, and that idea that something just comes, comes to you. John Dewey wrote a fabulous book um, in 1934 called Arthur's Experience where he talked about what that is and he talked about it as the aesthetic experience. It's, it's different from but equal to writing, reading, arithmetic, all of those things. It's a, it is a, uh, a sense-based knowing that occurs and hence its relationship with religion um, that occurs when we, in the arts, when we meet an object that we are fascinated by, that we are connected with, that we need to know more about, um, and we find it challenging. And what Dewey says is that it's in that period of discomfort when we kind of think we know what the painting's saying, but we're not quite sure, and we grapple with it, and by the end of it, we have a new understanding and a new knowledge. He says that kind of knowing um, is a very different kind of knowing from the instrumental everyday knowing that we have. So um, uh, that's, I think, the connection between the spiritual and that's why we often feel when we go to a performance or we see a piece of dance or go to an art gallery and we somehow feel out of ourselves, we, som we somehow feel different from how we are in the everyday world. I think you've written that art is transformative. Into what? <laughs> yeah, I, there's a lot of criticism around that word. Um, my notion of transformation occurs when thought and emotion connect to give you a new understanding of what it means to be in the world. Yep. Is that public value number two? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's one portion of it, yeah. Uh, but it would go, notice that that one would register at the individual level. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then the question is, is, would it be better or worse for a society to have large numbers of people who had had that experience a lot of times? Mm -hmm. right? um, and, uh, and you won't see that in the annual report to QPAC, you know, you know transformative individuals. Well, 17,000. Uh, you know. No, but I, I, I think in some sense, you know, I mean, one crude way to think about it is that when you look at a revenue that was generated by a ticket sale, right, you're getting an approximation of an estimate of that value, mm -hmm. right? Because that person went to have something happen to them there, right, that they couldn't get some other place. So, okay, so uh, it's there, right? And I got it, one estimate of it, which is the, um, you know, the price that was paid. And now the interesting question is, is to what extent did that, does that price that was paid reflect the full social value uh, of that experience? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think one of the interesting and challenging questions, about, um, as one of my uh, colleagues, there's a fellow named Bob Putnam, who's written a great deal about uh, social capital. And He's what he means by social capital is... He's uh, Bob to you, he's Robert to us. Okay, uh, Robert Poplin, okay. So... Uh, he wrote Bowling Alone, which is probably more accurate. Right, uh, and the basic idea in this idea of social capital is that a certain amount of social capital exists between you and me if I can ask you to do something and you'll say yes and the account won't be settled right away, right? So that, uh, and that's what it means to have social capital. And what he's demonstrated is that uh, societies that have lots of social capital tend to do better economically, socially, and politically, and governmentally than societies that don't have much social capital, right? Okay, well that's kind of an interesting illustration because if one way we think about what is functionally important about culture, yeah. right, is that it is an instrument through which uh, social capital gets constructed, mm. then uh, this would be uh, an important reason to be concerned about the arts. He then makes an absolutely critical distinction, though, between what he describes as bonding social capital, which mm -hmm. means people, like people connecting up with one another, and bridging social capital, which is uh, different people uh, linking up with one another and feeling some degree of kinship, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the arts, uh, like, all, like religion and like sports, mm -hmm. all of these things, is the degree to which it builds uh, bonding versus bridging social capital. And so one of the things that you can have as an experience uh, with your own culture is take a great deal of pride in sort of the expression of your culture. I mean, you can, you, you can go anywhere and see that happen. Mm -hmm. that people will just respond to an expression of a group of, you know, an artistic expression of a group of people that they identify with and feel great about it and stuff like that. The, the question, though, turns out to be is that creates a strong sense of in-group, right? And then the question is, is, well, is that helpful or hurtful with respect to bonding bridging capital? And I've gone to a lot of places, right, where um, cultures are presented by themselves and there are other cultures in that place, and mm -hmm. they present too, mm -hmm. all right? And I've never seen it once happen, never once, right, that the people uh, fight with one another at the end of that, all right? That what happens is they look and they say, oh my God, that's interesting, what did you do? And, and then they present their thing, oh my God, that's what's interesting. Now it may be that the only people who show up at those events are people who are prepared to be entertained mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. something exotic and different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but boy, if that's who shows up, then we ought to do everything we possibly can to give them lots of opportunities to do that, mm -hmm. right? Because that group of people is probably really, really important in the construction of a democratic capacity to govern. Can, I, can, can I just add to that? Uh, yeah. What I think is most interesting is, I going back to neuroscience, if you think about art, religion, and sport, right. one of the things I think that happens is that um, Christopher Bolas talks about this idea that when you are actually at the theatre or at sport or whatever, you have this, this, because you're watching something or if you're engaged in something, you have this time where he calls, uh, you can psychically suspend the way you know the world right. to allow another person's point of view to actually permeate you, to think other. And, you know, that is the basis of empathy, really. And, you know, if, if we have one claim in the arts, I think we teach empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sport does too, I'm not saying. But this idea of psychic suspension to be able to think other, I think is one of the great characteristics in, um, you know, in art. Jeff Walker. I was going to say that uh, in terms of the um, question of social capital's intrinsic importance to public value, uh, I think the hard-nosed question that still remains, even today, 2013, uh, you'd think with the twin shocks of global financial crisis and climate change, that would be enough to sort of say there's value there. But um, interestingly, you mentioning Lord Putnam, I was telling you earlier, Sue, but uh, 
on the September 11, which is 12 hours before it actually happened in New York, we, Rob Putnam was here. A group of us hosted him. It was probably at the peak of interest in that whole phenomenal interest that peaked very quickly and went dropped away really quickly on social capital. But he spoke here. And, uh, and then, of course, September 11 happens that night, our time. And the next morning, as you'd expect, um, most, you know, because it was over a thousand people and we, it was known that we were hosting it and facilitating it. I got quite a few calls, but it was, of course, in reference to what had happened the night before. But it was an amazing, completely split crowd. No one sat anywhere near the middle, completely split crowd. The one crowd, social capital's out the door now. It doesn't matter a jot, does it? You know, forget about it. And another crowd with it right at the other end, social capital. And it was really 50-50. Social capital is going to be, on, be the only way we recover here. Mm -hmm. So um, it's... <laughs> yeah. well, that was... No, that's interesting because that is an event, of course, in which either the bombing social capital could have turned out to be dominant and America could have decided that um, all Islam was its enemy, right? Or uh, we could have uh, reached for a common humanity of some kind and gotten past it. And one of the interesting features about the political leadership of the United States following that was, was very disappointing to me because at the outset the political leadership in America basically, remember the very first statements that came out of President Bush's uh, mouth were, this doesn't mean that all Islam is our enemy. You know, we're, uh, and I thought, man, he's going he's gonna to actually build some bombing uh, uh, social or some bridging social capital here, right? <laughs> and then, of course, mm, you know, it went uh, <laughs> in the, the, the usual direction. Um, but, uh, but I think we're still fighting our way out of that, you know. And I think, uh, so I don't, you know, how to say it. I, I think then why does George W. Bush have better popularity figures in the Middle East today than does Barack Obama? I think, I don't, I don't know. Can't because can I have a stab? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Be brave. Uh, because people want certainty, and he offered certainty. Uh, oh. You know, I think, and, and the, the area that I think we haven't touched on that I'd want to raise in this whole public value debate is um, I think that the art, the, the whole arts, feelings and emotions connection, the nexus between those areas, because I think... Um, People experience the arts individually and collectively, but first of all, individually. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of writing about, uh, and particularly in, in uh, social media, about emotion and, and the uh, enormous kind of freedom that we have to emote wherever we want. But I don't know that um, we do a very good job, and I class myself in this category as, an, as educators, in actually educating our feeling lives. I think it is a particular kind of education that we assume that someone else will do. And I think it's another area um, where the arts can really shine. And, and I guess I'm really interested as an arts educator in this notion that we have, we have art as a noun everywhere. We have performances and people showing, but where we really need to do the work is using art as a verb. You know, how do we, how do we access, how do we understand, how do we learn about ourselves? How do we stop the atrocities that go on in the world, in our communities, in our families, in our, and I think the arts have a place to play there. And I think that's of enormous public value to us as a country. Yep, let me just uh, reset. Uh, if you're listening on the stream, our guests are Professor Mark Moore, Professor Judith McLean, and Jeff Wilcock, my name's Steve Austin. You can have your say at hashtag public value. We've got a guy in this town called David Engwich, and he's a community activist. He started opposing a road in this city about 20 years, 20 years ago. Uh, and he ends up, he's now flying around the world teaching about community engagement. And he had an idea for a bus run, and I wondered whether this might work for the arts. He went to Brazil in Curitiba, mm -hmm. and they wanted to put on a bus route to get people in poor areas into a rich area, into work. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't afford it, and the government wasn't going to fund the bus run. Mm -hmm. So he said, why don't you invert the proposition and uh, leave an honesty bucket at the front of the bus mm -hmm. and say to people, you put in the amount of money sure. that you think this bus mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, is worth to you, to mm -hmm. get you to work. And guess what happened? They earned more money than they ever predicted by any of their economic modelling mm -hmm. because people valued it, they mm -hmm. didn't know it, mm -hmm. it got them their work, it got them connection with families and all. Could the arts community, in whatever form, could QPAC, dare I say, do what a church does? The minister gives his sermon, passes the hat around, he gets a vote. Mm -hmm. uh, the arts community do the same thing. <laughs> well, uh, 
one answer to that is the arts community is already doing that. Okay. So that if we actually had a way to uh, visualize the arts community uh, as something other than just QPAC, right? And this, I think, is actually one of the critical things to understand is that mm -hmm. QPAC is a firm within a large sector and a large industry, mm -hmm. all right? And the right way to value QPAC then is not just in terms of what it does individually, but what it does in terms of leveraging the mm -hmm. character and scale and activities of the uh, larger industry as a whole, all right? Mm -hmm. And it can't do that by command and control, and it can't do it by uh, paying everybody everything. Um, so it's going to do it by uh, through some other persuasive means. And I think that when you looked out at that whole industry, if, if you could imagine doing that apart from QPAC, what you'd see is a lot of people paying money into the till without anybody uh, asking them to do it, right? And it would be all those people that are, uh, I you know, you could call them volunteers or quasi-volunteers. Mm -hmm. Just like if you looked at the sports sector, you know, you'd see all those people that are um, volunteering their time to coach teams and mm -hmm. um, uh, do all that. And so, and, um, you know, people that are creating little uh, art venues here and there. And so, it, it seems to me like, yeah, you already got people uh, ponying up, and all you have to do is wander around the streets or the schools or something like that, and you'll see people uh, voluntarily making art. Um, Jeff? It's a good story because uh, I, I think it, it, it strikes at that heart of democratizing measurement mm -hmm. and democratizing that public value. And uh, that's what's so, to me, essential about it. It's got to be the way. Um, it, I've just had a very short time in North America, but one of their biggest philanthropic organizations, very interestingly, and quite after a long time, I don't know, I think they've existed for over 100 years, United Way. Mm -hmm. But they're now, uh, in only in a couple of places as a trial, but putting in huge amounts of dollars to disadvantaged geographical areas in the, in, to community foundations. Your, your call, your way to spend it, your way to be accountable for it. And um, I think it's a really interesting trend. We, we're a mile off that, I would have thought, here, because we're just, uh, in terms of our philanthropic infancy, but in terms of addressing disadvantage and place-based disadvantage, I, I wonder how um, quickly we could get to that, that point. I think it's still many, many years off um, being at that kind of scenario that, that Dave's been part of in Colombia. Um, there's lots of good little moments of it, mm. but um, another uh, long way off. The other, the other angle on, on that question of, of value and the role of the arts that I think I always say, we're not, not that I'm always <laughs> in arts audiences, but I, I think it's actually to turn things on their heads is to ask why any intervention, whatever it be for whatever purpose in, in disadvantaged areas, and I see a lot of them, why it doesn't have an arts-led approach to it. That put an argument up about why you haven't used an arts and culture-led approach. Mm. That would be to, to turn it mm. on its head. Mm. At the moment, it's seen always as the exception. Oh, that's cute. You do a cultural yeah. intervention. Um, Steve, there's a tweet there that probably demands a response, and it's from Adam James Tucker, and it says, using arts as a verb, is this the foundation to begin measuring? Um, I think um, it is, but it's, it's a descriptive measurement, and many of you will be familiar with Alan Brown's work um, and his new descriptors on how we can measure um, in a meaningful way an arts activity, and he talks about captivation, emotional resonance, um, aesthetics, those kinds of definitions in that study. And I think, uh, I, I don't, I think when we think of, uh, for me anyway, when I hear the word measurement, I think numer numeracy. And I think we have to rethink that. I think it was um, the writer, Melissa Lukashenko, who said, the audience gives us the, their trust and we give them new eyes. That's um, probably a nice way of, yeah. of putting it. We've had in this state recently, uh, Mark Moore, a thing called the Queensland Plan. Uh, and it's, uh, I approached it very cynically as a journalist, first of all, but they basically <laughs> polled massively and very deeply mm -hmm. a huge body of Queenslanders mm -hmm. and said, you know, what, what do you want to do? Where do you want the state to go? And you come up with the questions. And they came up with six questions and then they're about to be rolled out disappointingly into government policy. <laughs> um, but w the, the questions and the yeah. actual document yeah. was rivetingly, riveting reading. Who would have thought that out of this you know, yeah. political process? Because what came out of the six yeah. questions was this deep analysis that Queenslanders feel disconnected, wondering what their values are and how we get back to some sort of community mm. feeling. Mm. Now, not the sort of community cohesion, but 
the first question that, the, that Queenslanders came up with is how do we move from me to we? Mm -hmm. yep, that's the it's a question. philosophical question. Absolutely. It's a, it's a question for the art world. Absolutely. And the whole document has this whole tone to it about I am feeling disconnected from my community yep. and it's really worrying me. Mm -hmm. uh, and this came from the body of Queensland. I flick it off to some sociologists make them read this. This, mm -hmm. this is a mind and attitude study of the state of Queensland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the only people that can address that is Judith's point about either religion, yeah. uh, uh, art, or culture. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because when I was the head of the Hauser Center at the Kennedy School, and we were uh, doing a lot of work trying to understand the role that the voluntary sector was playing in democratic societies and stuff like that, so it included arts but many others, um, I was actually having this, had a, a series of uh, seminars with the dean of the, who, woman who became the dean of the law school at Harvard, a uh, woman, wonderful woman named Martha Minow, who's father had been in charge of public broadcasting for a while in the United States as well. And uh, she came up with this wonderful phrase that she said, our problem in the United States right at the moment is we know longer how to get to we. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I thought it was, so let me make, sorry, let me, that's one phrase that I remember. Another thing, going back to John Dewey, who I think is actually uh, somebody that we all ought to return and read, mm -hmm. But he wrote in a book called The Public and Its Problems that the fundamental challenge of a democratic society was to have people who were capable of, quote, calling a public into existence that could understand and act on its own interest, right? Which is another way of thinking about what it means to create a we out of a bunch of eyes, all right? The, so you have to give the eyes respect for their individual autonomy and stuff like that. You have to understand that there's gonna be a lot of different values that are at stake there. But then the question is, is what do we have to do on the political side to construct a we out of a bunch of eyes, right? What I think is so interesting about that is that uh, it reminds us that a public doesn't exist automatically. It has to be constructed and created because we mostly all wanna live our lives as individuals and what a liberal society allows us to do is to do that. But every now and then we gotta get together and decide some stuff together because we're gonna use state power and we all use, own the power of the state. So now we have to figure out uh, what it is that we're gonna do with that, uh, that particular state power. But then the idea is, um, so then how do we help people understand and in understanding then prepare themselves to act on behalf of their own self-interest, right? And going back to Judith's very early statement that um, I think she described it as a, there's what the stakeholders getting together and you had a particular phrase for it, uh, a forum of, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't remember. Pardon me? Uh, pardon me? What did we say? Oh yeah, rather a side of learning a rather side than of a side of truth. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so sorry. that if you imagine that there's a public that convenes itself and tries to answer the question, what the hell are we doing with the arts and how come we're not relying solely on market or charitable contribution to this? Why do we have any government dough in this at all? All right, mm. that that would be uh, a site of learning where the uh, public could be called into existence and we could understand what it is that we're trying to do with the arts and why it is that we think it's worth taxing and regulating ourselves to uh, produce uh, more of what would naturally occur anyway. Because um, it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, to put some energy in there right. because that's where the learnings are to, to renew and to go forward. It's and yet we seem to put all the energy into the initial part rather than letting people do what they do, uh, treating it as a learning experience and then moving or forward. Or we think that all the learning happens on the production side. See, what, what's interesting to me is that a lot of learning happens on what I would describe as the collective arbitration of value side, mm. right, uh -huh. where we have to get That's together right. and talk a little bit to yeah. figure out what the hell we've got at stake in, mm. uh, you know, in a particular, mm. this particular And at the area. heart of that, Paul, I think, Mark, is, is, is again this measurement. And again, it gets, gets, gets reduced down to, is it some num people counting some numbers? But the, interestingly, the Queensland plan to share your thoughts very much, Kev, that it was, a, it was this stunning community mm. plan, far more than it was ever a political <laughs> plan. But it culminated in the two days, just again, a few hundred metres from us here. Yeah. And the... the it never got to a measurement discussion, even though people would have seen on their Twitter feeds and everything, they're moving into a session now to discuss appropriate measures. No one discussed measures. But what's so interesting about it is that you could imagine that the nomination of a particular measurement uh, system could be used as a provocation 
yes. for that political discussion, exactly. right? Yeah. And so instead of imagining that we have the political conversation and then we construct a measurement system, which is actually too hard, <laughs> uh, you can imagine that somebody shows up and says, well, here's our measurement system. <laughs> what do you guys think of this, right? Mm -hmm. And have people say, oh my God, that's the worst thing I ever saw in my life. This mm -hmm. thing's gotta be thrown out and we gotta create a measure of this, but you'll never do it because yes. we can't measure it. Yes. And that, but that turns out, I think, to be a much more interesting and generative mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. about there would be a conversation about, well, oh my God, I didn't even think that's what we had at State of the Arts. I mean, that's what we were after? Oh, gee, I hadn't thought about that. Let me think about that a little bit. So there's something about, uh, <laughs> this is this weird world in which the, the idea of the measurement system becomes an instrument for orchestrating a political conversation mm -hmm. rather than simply uh, organizing a system of, uh, of public accountability and maybe even the learning of the organization. Mm -hmm. But it stimulates the political conversation mm -hmm. and puts it on a firm uh, political and philosophical ground rather than leaving it in the hands of the measurement guys and the accountants. Um, Can I ask the three of you to address a question that sort of bounces out of that from my mind? Neil Ferguson, yep. the economic historian yep. at Harvard, observes as guys like Paul Berman and a whole range of others that the West is in a state of collapse or pre-collapse. And by that he doesn't mean all the Western buildings are falling over and slipping into the city. What he means is that the common idea the common story yeah. or values that held us together have eroded. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talking about what, sec what sociologists call the post-Christian world. Mm -hmm. So that common uh, idea is eroded mm -hmm. or is fraying at the edges. And as a result, a, so a society loses its inner, yeah. its sense of itself. Right. Is public value in arts and culture in any way able Connected to fill that, that gap? Yep. Can I speak to Go that? If you like. Sorry. So uh, I would say the answer to that is yes, all right? And I think partly it's because uh, what I think is really missing is an appropriate sense of our interdependence, all right? So here it's what I think is the paradox of the sort of modern world, which is the fact of our lives is that we live in an increasingly interdependent society. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I think about the number of people that I'm depending upon when I get up in the morning to have my day go well, right? It's huge, and I gotta worry about whether my computer's working, my automobile's fixed, where did the food come from? And all of those, each of those questions drags behind it a huge, large chain of people that are organized to do work that I'm unaware of and couldn't control. But if it didn't exist, I'd be in, out of, I'd be in trouble. I just couldn't get through my day. So the, the fact of our life is that we're incredibly and increasingly interdependent, right? Our subjective experience of our life is that we're increasingly independent, <laughs> right? And you look at that and say, oh, wow, something's really strange here because uh, you know, they, don't, they don't line up. And so if the challenge is to recover a sense of interdependence, all right, uh, and then figure out, I mean, that's a bad place to end up because nobody wants to be interdependent with anybody. God knows that's a real pain. Um, but once we discover that, then figuring out how in the world we could manage our interdependence in a way that would be satisfactory uh, is, I think, a, you know, the basic challenge of governance. One last comment on this. I was astonished to discover that um, the idea of statistics, all right, was uh, created in the um, uh, 1400s and 1500s in Europe. And it was at a time when states were creating themselves out of um, villages, basically, right? And so we had these centralizing regimes show up and stuff like that. And one of the things that the centralizing regimes had to do was to try to create a uh, representation of who they were as an entity. <laughs> and they had to then invent a way that would allow them to uh, describe themselves, yeah. right? So they had to develop statistics, <laughs> statistics, right? As a way of representing who the population was, how big it was, how many people there were, where they were located, whether they were young or old, what their occupation was and stuff like that. And it was only when they had the statistical capacity to represent the whole population, mm. right, that they could create a cultural basis that said, uh, mm. we're in this together. <laughs> Did you see what I'm saying? Yep. And so this picture then of sort of statistics as a, as a way of seeing what it is that we have in common and all the ways in which we're different and where we can accept both the difference and the, uh, the fact that we're all there represented somehow in the statistics um, is I think one way of understanding what it means to be interdependent and I'll take it from there. Judith, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important question. And I think, you know, people talk about the spiritual desiccation of the 21st century and how, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the artists in here will, will um, correct me or someone on Twitter will. But, you know, I think it was Auden who said the centre will not hold and that 
uh, you know, the, the narratives of marriage with three kids and, you know, women, roles of men and women and all of those things have changed so dramatically in the 21st century. And again, neuroscientifically, we know that change and creating new neural pathways is incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly difficult to do. So people tend not to do it. I think what the arts can do on various levels, I think just in terms of, you know, when I chaired the River Festival, I can remember there was always this terrible conversation around the board table around how can you be chairing um, a, a, a festival that's actually supposedly an ecological festival and you're shooting crackers up into the air, you know. And one of the things I used to say was, yeah, I know, I get it, but one of the things that it did was it brought 60,000 people out onto the streets of Brisbane where they had to sort of, at one level, learn to be a weed. Right. Um, and so it seemed to me that was a compromise worth having. So it's sort of, there's that level. Then I think there's all the levels that I've talked about, about, you know, building a resilient and emotional self. I think the arts can teach us that one. there aren't any safe sure, sureties about being a human being, that life is volatile, ambiguous, and we have to learn to cope with it, you know, and m more than ever, I think. Jeff, we're, we're alone in, I think in 15 years' time, the dominant household in Britain mm. will be a single occupant <laughs> household. Mm. It'll be the, the dominant sector, if you like. Yeah, you much talk <laughs> about that. But, I, I, you know, there's a lots of grand narratives and posts this and lots of deaths yeah. have been greatly exaggerated. I, I mean, I, I, he's probably a level intellectually for mo most people below that, but I don't think, I think he has any peer in terms of documenting Australian he, he life is Hugh McKay. I mean, mm. Hugh McKay's good life and I think his best work to date, and he's got a lot of good stuff. That's his most current work. I mean, it is essentially about, as it were, more third evidence we're a tribal species. There's plenty of evidence that we're still yearning more than ever for that mm. tribal experience. Mm. And, and yes, in the face of real forces that are alienating and ma making us more independent, but there's plenty of, I think, reasons to be optimistic. Mm. Um, not, not hyper about it, but uh, optimistic, and, and that arts and culture in its broadest sense, is absolutely pivotal and at the heart of that. Mm. All right. Mm. Judith, um, T.S. Eliot, I mean, you talked about framing before in your introduction. I think, from memory, T.S. Eliot, uh, in his book on Notes on a Definition of Culture, he argued that religious philosophy frames culture. Um, can culture invert that? You th if, if we're divorced from our religious or spiritual roots, or if it's fraying at the edges, mm -hmm. And religion was what framed it. I haven't heard anyone really d dispute that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it. I think it has. I think if you uh, and look, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think if you ask Gen X, Y, Zs, and that they would say it has. Mm. That becomes very clear when we have the Asia Pacific Triennial. Mm. You, you see a very different religious influence mm. in visual representation mm. of art and culture. Mm. I mean, the, what's going to open over at the. Uh, at um, Goma next or this week, I think it is size exhibition. I think is exactly addressing that issue. Right. Okay. Mm. One, one extra question mm. for me actually is is um, well, one possibility is that art turns out to be important because it gives expression to uh, normative frameworks that are already present and vital in the society. Okay. So that the way we recognize. Uh, art as compelling and valuable and stuff is because it uh, speaks to uh, some set of values that we already hold, right? And we could think of that as a kind of art that was supportive in some sense, right? But we also expect art to play the role of challenger. Absolutely. Right? Uh, and to say, uh, actually, all the things that you thought were true are probably false, right? Or might be false. And here's an, uh, the new eyes to use in looking at it, right? So you can imagine that um, art is always simultaneously supporting and undermining an existing uh, normative culture, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think that you like art in the modern world and like art as a uh, thing in a democracy is precisely because if allowed to pursue its own ends, mm -hmm. it will both support and undermine uh, whatever is the dominant culture that's uh, present at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So. So I think you want art as the kind of engine of, of um, uh, sort of uh, both a moral support and a moral, moral commentary on the way people are currently living. Um, and, but having said that, notice that 
we never wanted religion to be the uh, dominant normative frame. We always depended on it to be that, but it never wasn't, wasn't consistent with the democratic ideal. Mm. Art can't be a dominant moral frame because it'll be all over the lot all the time in a useful way. Um, mm. Religion we've never you know, been enthusiastic about. Um, so the question is, is, well, where is the moral frame being constructed then? Mm -hmm. right? And you know what the horrible answer to that question is? Nowhere. No, politics. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, if you ask the question, so where is there the secular discussion mm -hmm. about uh, what justice requires yeah. of us and what we owe to one another and uh, what we mm -hmm. think of constitutes progress and how could we measure it? Uh, those are basically moral questions, right? I mean, they're not uh, – and the people who, for better or ill, are – responsible for orchestrating that conversation among us uh, as a group of politicians. A and whether Australians and probably Americans place politicians as a, as a profession? Very low. So because what so does it say about our moral guardians? Yeah, I think the, I mean, don't get me started on this, but this is a whole other world of sort of the set of changes that I think would uh, be important to try to create in politics. and. If the arts could do a little bit to improve the quality of our politics, that would be uh, worth a lot in and of itself. Uh, so. I mean, one of those really fundamental long-term changes, changes in politics surely is, uh, is long-term planning. And that, that, that's why, I, again, back on this Queensland plan, was, there was a lot of hope invested in it. Who knows where it'll go it's now that it's likely to become an act of the state of parliament. Let me ask a question that's coming on Twitter. Inga T says, capitalism seems to create progress for nations but economic focus demotes value of social and cultural progress. Can we change this? <laughs> How? Uh, by essentially uh, trying to get close to what people are really thinking and feeling and give them a chance to express that in company of others. So that's the public value of arts and culture. Absolutely. It taps into what people are really thinking and feeling, how they express it. Mm -hmm. And Great gives us some standing in addition to uh, sort of economic progress. Look, I'm thinking, um, mm. bearing in mind that you've been waiting very patiently and that I think our audience has a great BS meter, uh, so I'd be very uh -oh. keen... Uh-oh, I better run. Come on. <laughs> uh, so I'd be very keen now to uh, open up to questions from uh, the floor or perhaps if there's any questions via Twitter. Since we've got such a collection of uh, cutting-edge art and culture aficionados in the room, uh, I would dearly love it if you'd come and now challenge my guests who've been given a very comfortable ride by me uh, and ask them uh, a, a real-world question. So I look forward to the, uh, the annual report of QPAC or an arts report simply saying uh, the, the tangibles are these and the intangibles are what we don't have to tell you. So we have a microphone here. So if there's a question from the audience, I'd love it if you come to the microphone uh, and put it to our guests. Just give us your name and organisation if you dare. Um, and uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, so just make your way to the microphone and put it up. Um, then if art has this high, art and culture has this high moral order and it's framed, or oh, sorry, the, the argument or it's controlled by politicians, what do these people do? Because these people have to straddle uh, public value one and two, uh, the tangible and the intangible. They have to get the tangible, account for it, uh, and try and communicate mm -hmm. to their lords and masters, those politicians you mentioned, yeah. often, not always. Yeah. Uh, See, I, I, don't, I would object to the idea of tangible and intangible. And in okay. some ways, that was the language that I was trying to stay away from. Because sure. No, no, it's, it's okay, because I think it often does get framed mm -hmm. that way. And I think that it often is used defensively by uh, organizations that sort of say, well, gee, the things that we're about are so... Uh, ethereal and uh, ephemeral that, you know, we couldn't possibly call to account for that. And I, I don't actually believe that because I don't, because I want actually people to be able to demonstrate uh, value creation and even more importantly, I want uh, them to learn how to produce more of it, right? So in order for that to be true, we have to find a way to make things that are currently represented as intrinsically intangible that could not possibly be measured, yeah. right? And show that that's not true, right? Um, and what that does for me often is to put a lot of pressure on the construction of the new systems of measurement, right? But that has to start with this philosophical yeah. and political side that sort of says if I had to tell a story mm -hmm. and I started finding myself using language of intangible stuff, right, then it would be incumbent on me to try to then drive down and sort of say, well, suppose I took that story seriously, how could I measure whether it was reliably occurring in the world? And this then 
brings these two different ideas and account back into a relationship to one another. And among the most interesting things uh, that's often referred to as being intangible that uh, you were talking about is the quality of relationships among people, mm. right? Now, I don't think there's anything intangible about that at all, <laughs> right? I think that uh, every day we have a concrete uh, uh, psychological experience of the quality of our relationships with the people that we work with, that we play with, that we encounter on the street, that we, um, you know, that we uh, have in mind that there might be somebody that we can mm. call on to get some help, that mm. uh, somebody who when they show up we think we're inclined to listen to what they have to say versus not. I mean, this is an ordinary, completely reliable human experience that we are aware of our uh, social status and our relationships with other people and uh, stuff like that. So to describe that as intangible strikes me as bizarre. It might have been an uninteresting matter to measure, right? But even the private sector now goes, spends a huge amount of its time mm -hmm. measuring the strength of its uh, relationships with mm -hmm. its customers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if they think they can measure the relationship with their customers and do that for economic advantage, well, geez, if we're after the goal of producing higher quality social relationships among people, we ought to be able to measure that as, as well and go after it. That's so. because their customers ask one question, what's in it for me? Uh, part of the, 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 the well, intangible I is... I don't think it's much more complicated. It's, yeah, it's what's in it for me, but then the answer to that question could be lots of things. Mm. I, I sell you an automobile. Well, what is it that you value about the automobile? Well, I just value the fuel economy. Oh, well, I love the styling. I like the color. I like the... Uh, image of power it gives me. I like the way it warms my butt in the uh, <laughs> cold weather, you know. There are a hundred different attributes that go into that particular thing. And, and maybe it even is, I like the guy who sold me the car. I trust him. And every mm -hmm. other person I ever saw, I didn't trust in this auto transaction, mm -hmm. right? And so the critical thing turns out to be the construction right. of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be any of those things. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is that um, people are complicated. They want lots of different things from one another. Uh, and the relationship consists of, uh, you know, the, a variety of different transactions and feelings about the relationship they have with one another. And uh, that's what we're trying to create. Um, you know, and if, uh, you know, you, you can do all kinds of psychological experiments in this. You could show people a picture and sort of say, what do you think of this guy? And maybe the first five years we're in this business, they say, I hate the guy just from looking at him, all right? Mm -hmm. And the next five years later, they say, oh, looks like he might have something interesting to say. Mm. Well, that would be a huge cultural change mm. if that occurred, right? Yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, and if it turned out that the arts could produce that change such that, uh, you know, one person could look at another and say, you know, I used to think you were a jerk, and now I don't, right? Gee, I remember I spent a lot of my time trying to, uh, working with police departments at one stage, talking about um, uh, community policing, and we were trying to work there on the idea that uh, a high quality value producing police department would be one that had a strong relationship with the community, partly because that would allow them to solve more crime, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But also because that was their goal, mm -hmm. was to create strong relationships in the community, right? Mm -hmm. And so I remember this videotape of this guy that we'd been working with for a long time. He was a patrol officer, really hard nosed, Houston Police Department, you know, typical cop. And can I use some a little bit of profanity? Is that okay? No, it better not. Uh, yes. Yes? <laughs> so it's the arts community. <laughs> all right. So he, uh, he was being interviewed, and somebody said, so how do you like this community policing stuff? And he said, well, he said, when I was doing the old-fashioned policing, I thought everyone in the world was an asshole, right? But now I've been doing this for a while, and I think only about a third of the people are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I thought to myself, train. hooray! <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that was because that meant that when that guy got out of the car, Right? There was going to be a slightly different uh, reaction to uh, the person that he was there, and they were going to have a slightly different uh, relationship to the rest of the government. Now, interestingly enough, you can say, okay, that's the story. Mm. Now could you actually construct a statistical measurement to tell uh -huh. you the degree to which that's happening? Sure, it's uh -huh. easy. It's not hard to construct that statistical system. Mm. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I think this is an interesting question. Sport doesn't have to demonstrate its public value. Why is arts considered ex extra? I make a point about that, about you know, without denying that sports had a better run. Uh, you know, on, on television every night there's a sports report and there's not necessarily an arts report. So, I, But without wanting to sound defensive, one of the greatest things that's happened in my lifetime has just occurred in Australia, um, and that is that the national curriculum is actually going to occur in the arts in five areas right across every school child in this country mm. as from next year. Mm. That's a, a, a really remarkable change and I think will have ramifications, you know, in generations to come that we, we can't even imagine yet. 
So uh, while I agree, you know, they don't have to demonstrate, although I don't really buy that. Sport, you know, every where there's contestable funding, it's shrinking and everybody has to get better at defining what they do. So e so e-bookish, <laughs> that, that would be my answer. Going back to this other theme about QPAC as an organization versus in an industry, right? Wouldn't it be incredible if uh, one of the things that we were noticing is in that par very powerful strand that's running through the school system, mm. there was a QPAC influence, right, in the form of A, uh, we can provide a concrete experience to kids that will uh, change the way they experience the production of art in their own schools. Mm. B, we can construct a curriculum. C, we can send some, uh, we can connect them up with some local artist groups to mm. do. I mean, this would be a point of leverage then for uh, this curriculum thing that would be a whole, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, different yeah, return. Now then, of course, it gets harder to measure whether QPAC actually produced the effect or whether it was yeah. QPAC plus the schools. But I do that. Oh, come on! <laughs> if we got the needle moving in the right direction. Let's just keep doing it, you know, until it, uh, until we have to stop, mm. right? Uh, mm. So, let's see someone from the audience. You've got a Harvard professor here. Here's mm. your chance to grill him. All right, well, keep going. Sufficient intimidation. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Nothing uh, like uh, the brand Steve, name to Steve intimidate. Uh, so. uh, yeah. There was. There was. Right. <laughs> oh, here comes. <laughs> Names, if we don't already know. Uh, I'm Simon Gallagher. I'm a trustee of QPAC and on the board of QTC. Uh, I, my concern is that are we not approaching a new era, a new age, where, we should, where it should be an age of enlightenment? Uh, I feel as though we are still a little cocooned in, you know, within ourselves and we all possess the tools to move forward with the discussion. Is the subject also not about creating greater inclusion for the people that are currently not members of the club, so to speak? Is that fair enough to...? Yep, and I'd like to have a shot at answering that, and I think Julianne answers that really well when she says we are, we're, we're not organised. Um, I don't know if you heard on the radio this morning, on Radio National, they were talking about the car industry and how the number of jobs that are going to be lost if um, uh, Holden and Toyota actually move out of Adelaide. And the point was that there was a, an industry person actually quoting the kinds of ramifications that would happen. We're not good at that. We don't, you know, we, uh, we don't have those um, statistics at our fingertips. We don't have the narrative to tell about what our industry does and the breadth of our industry. So I, I agree with you. I think that you know, if we, if we could charge the Australia Council, Arts Queensland, um, and I know they're doing some of this work, but how do we get control of this big data and how do we tell our story? I think that's exactly right. So accessibility is, is my point, I suppose, and is then the model of a festival a better way to work, where a lot of the public money then goes into public experience, as well as a lot of other niche areas that different people from the population can see. They can see a great piece of theatre, mm -hmm. a great piece of ballet, but they can also go out and watch the crackers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need both. Mm. And, you know, that's what Arts for All Queensland strategy has been yeah. telling people, yeah. that communities are desperate not to have the expert, but to, uh, to have their own experiences, to produce their own work. To, uh, but we also need the flagships. We need places to aspire to. We need mm. artists to aspire to. So it's not an and or. It's an and, and, and. Who are the crackers? <laughs> oh, crackers are fireworks. fireworks. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought it was a new rock group. So what Simon's point also gets onto, not just around accessibility, but back on measures themselves, is that another issue we haven't touched on in this discussion today, but there's then that whole value-laden issue about prioritising which measures matter. I mean, you can mm -hmm. get a set of measures, it's the whole area that's a brought tension, I can tell you at the moment, with Jane Brewer statistics around various indices it produces, but it backs right off prioritising which factors are more important. They leave that to yeah. the research community. Mm. But, uh, well, they, you, know, you can leave that to the research community because that's a fundamental value <laughs> change. But you want to know what my answer to that is? I just, uh, I, um, I think that notice that you only have to face a trade-off among the yeah. effort to pursue a particular set of values if you're at what the economists would call the production possibility frontier. That is, you've absorbed, uh, learned all of the possible methods of trying to produce all of the things at the same time, and now you're stuck mm. 
the things that are on the production possibility frontier, and you have to choose whether you want high art or low art, right? And, but the only way that people are driven to the production possibility frontier is through competitive <coughs> markets, right? And even competitive <coughs> markets don't get most firms there, right? So I begin with a hypothesis that we're nowhere near the production possibility frontier. And therefore, we don't have to have the conversation about which things we're going to prioritize mm. more because chances are if we concentrate on it, we can produce more of everything we like. And we should operate on that hypothesis until we have statistical <laughs> evidence that says we're wrong yeah. about that, all right? Because I, I think everybody has loves this drama about, oh my goodness, we have this agonizing choice about whether we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And my, my opening my opening proposition would be, I don't think we face that choice. Let's try to produce, move the needle on all those things mm -hmm. as far as we can. Mm -hmm. And when we have incontrovertible evidence that we're facing a trade-off, then we can make the decision. Okay. But until we get there, and we won't get there for a while because we haven't done the measures to see whether we can actually <coughs> produce this result, uh, let's act as though we can get it all done. <laughs> John Cossacks. Uh, Mark, you've offered us a wonderful provocation, particularly to people in the performing arts. The mm -hmm. very nature of the performing arts is that it's ephemeral. Mm -hmm. So if you're not there, you're not there. Right. And it seems to me that the other notion of calling a public into existence is perhaps t something that could couple together with that. Mm -hmm. And we have, as Simon suggested, the tools at our fingertips to actually call the public in, in, into existence. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking on a practical notion, I'm t talking about creating a season. Sure. And that what we have is the capacity mm -hmm. to call a public into existence. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, other than to say I agree, um, you know, it's, uh, no, I don't, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, and, yeah. Can I ask a question that's coming from Twitter? Marcus James asks, does uh, quantita quantifying value restrict creative work that's outside the box? Jeff, do you want to answer that? Ooh, uh, no, I reckon it's a Judas question. Um, <laughs> it, it, it ought not to, but it is there's still, again, uh, one of those big dualisms which operate, not just in the measuring world, but in the qualitative and the quantitative. And mm -hmm. I mean, he's often um, credited with it. I think it's not correct. It's, it's not actually Einstein, but everyone <coughs> says it's Einstein because it sounds more powerful, but not everything that can be counted counts, and not yeah. everything that counts can be counted, that, yeah. that statement. But uh, it, <laughs> there is that, that, that uh, still that divide, and, and the academy, broadly speaking, just entrenches that divide and in most respects being still very solarized with its with its um, disciplines and so forth. So arts has got a challenge in itself just to overcome that, I think, issue to, 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 to go above that with the perception, rightly or wrongly again, that it, it comes from a largely qualitative, ephemeral, not able to be numerized. Um, look, I don't really have an answer to that, except to say that if you're setting up a project and applying for funding, it's really you who sets your own parameters. So really it shouldn't. That would be my answer to that. I don't, I don't know if that's a great answer. But I want to, if I may, I want to just change the topic for a moment. And it's, sorry Barbara, I'll just do this. Um, you know, if we look back at the history of art, and in the history of art in Australia particularly, and we think about, you know, the Matthew Arnold idea of high and noble art that had a civilising effect and that's where we sort of started. And we go to today where, as I look at the Arts for All Queensland strategy, and, and this is true, I know, because I live it, that the newest kind of buzz thing that's happening in the arts is cultural tourism. Um, and we say, okay, oh, you know, right along that continuum, we have the purposes of art. I just wonder, you know, whether there's any conversation around about how artists and artistic directors and arts workers and arts organisations show leadership and partnership with the tourism sector. Because I sit on, um, I'm the chair of the um, granting body for the regional grants for tourism. And so we, I look at events and, you know, it's not happening. There seems to be there's an opportunity that is wide open for better connection and better partnerships there. And I just wonder whether anybody in the audience has any knowledge of that or can talk about that and whether that's my experience is, is can be affirmed or argued with. Or I think Singapore's done it. They, um, they set up a, an entertainment precinct and put a casino right in the middle of it. <laughs> Uh, and it's a very Asian culture, Asian values. It's very dramatic, architecturally beautiful. Mm. It's major on the actual landscape 
mm. of the city mm. and it's raking in a lot of money mm. and the Queensland government's seen it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, no. That's right. Can I use this, uh, both Judith's uh, comment and the former question to make a point, which is that um, when, we're when we're measuring the value of art, I think what we're interested in is looking at the, uh, at the effects of the art on uh, the person who produced it, the person who sponsored it, and the person who consumes it, mm. right? And so I think we can only decide whether uh, a piece of art is valuable, right, when we see the effect that it has, mm. right? And so this then acts as though that we, and this is common in the public sector, that instead of doing the evaluation on the effects, we do the evaluation on the process, right? And at that moment, it suppresses creativity everywhere, all the time. A bureaucracy that uh, measures its performance by compliance with an existing set of policies and procedures is never going to be able to change, right? Because it's evaluated on doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any particular reason why um, uh, the measurement of the effects of art would have any important impact on the character of the art that's being produced, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Particularly if among the effects of art that we're looking for is this particular kind of challenge mm. uh, that might come that sort of says, I just got some new eyes, thank you very much. And that one of the things that we value as an, uh, as an arts community is to say, look, I think we're tough enough here to you know, take some pretty big provocations from the art world. Um, and certainly part of our uh, life as a democratic polity ought to be that we're uh, prepared to be challenged by unconventional pictures and uh, stuff like that. It's, you know, one of the things that we don't often say about a democratic society is that, as a democratic citizen, you, you got to be. You're supposed to be a little tough. You know, you're not supposed to have everything be just the way you like it. There's, you have to get used to the fact that there's a lot of different human beings living in the world with a lot of different uh, attitudes and not be offended by that. You know, uh, and so I think art is a way of reminding us that. Um, uh, we ought to be a little bit tough enough to support a certain amount of provocations uh, as, a, as a characteristic of being a citizen mm -hmm. would be a useful thing to have. Is know? public value the same as what the, the public values? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Barbara. Or I, should value. I'd add to that. Dis <laughs> uh, Mark, discomfort is a very underrated virtue. I agree with you. Sorry, Mark. I agree with you 100% <laughs> on that. So that one we might have to uh, cultivate a taste for. Uh, so. so I'm Barbara Piscatelli. I'm on the board of the Queensland Museum. And I actually like big data sets. So one of the big data sets that I look at is ABS 4901.0, which is the data set on children's participation in arts and culture. Ooh, I love it. Now, this data set is very interesting. It's only been gathered since 2000. It's been gathered uh, every three years. Interesting. And a very interesting thing is happening in this data set. Children are participating in arts and culture more and more. Absolutely. And more. Absolutely. Every year there's a statistically significant rise in children's cultural participation. Now this says to me, as somebody who's interested in arts and culture and in childhood, that that is the value. I agree. We have living value. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. It's here every day in every person. Yeah. We walk around the cultural precinct here, we see it. Mm -hmm. It's thriving and it's buzzing. But then we have this other problem. The 71% of Australian children who are going there are going outside of school. Right. They're not going during school hours because of the numerous obstacles that schools put in place in terms of children's participation in art and culture. So I'm hoping that next year, when the new national curriculum comes in and we get more access to arts and cultural learning in school, that we'll actually see the 71% rise dramatically over time as children take part in more and more arts and cultural activities. It just seems to me that this data set is something that we're not using Absolutely. strategically, mm -hmm. and we need to do that. And the other thing I want to say is this, and, um, and that is that the Queensland Museum undertook a big study two years ago, three years ago, called a Contingent Valuation Study. Do you know about these? No. Okay. So what we did was to try to measure the value of the Queensland Museum. We did this by interviewing 2,000 people. And the interviews showed that people valued the organization the even the if they They've never, never came. Sure. Mm. It's the option value. Mm. The option value. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think that it's really important for us to harness both of those values, mm -hmm. the rising population value mm -hmm. and the inherent value of the organization, and use that to build our arguments. Mm -hmm. 
So what I, my question to you is, how do you build the argument? Can uh, I just while Barbara's still, while you're still there, can I ask, because somebody likes big data, what you'd link 4901 with, or do you link that with other big data? I look at the um, adult cultural participation too, but children are outstripping adults. How about old folks? My, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I'm quite convinced of is that the arts are going to flourish as uh, the population ages, right? Because uh, uh, for all kinds of obvious reasons, is if I were investing in you guys right now on simply the question of whether you're going to be more or less popular in the future, I would invest on uh, demographics alone. Uh, but um, just one other quick comment on that because the story about the kids is so compelling. Um, when I was doing work with um, uh, 13 state arts agencies in the United States, right, and however difficult you think you have as a problem as a public arts agency in Australia, you haven't seen anything until you try to do this work in the United States. But, um, but this one guy came and gave this talk and it was the most stunning thing. He said, you know, when a kid's five years old or six years old, they do art all the time, every day. They tell stories, they dance, they sculpt, they draw pictures, they, uh, all the arts that you can imagine, they, they're engaged in constantly. It's just what they do is, uh, is play, we call it play, right? And then he said, by the time they're 13, they've all stopped, right? And you look at that and you think, you think, man, he's right about that. I, you know, I wonder what the hell happened, you know? It's really interesting that that's true. And then, of course, now I'm thinking, as I'm getting uh, older and older, I'm getting ready to play again. And so I'm uh, uh, thinking, you know, so where's the clay? You know, where's the finger paints? Where's the, you know, blah, blah, blah. But anyway. Did you want to pick up on any further? No, no. 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 Okay. no Judy. Um, no, I'm fine. I mean, here's okay. another one. Here's another. Um, would we be more sorry to lose strong arts for the auto industry? You know. We're biased, aren't we, in this room? <laughs> uh, the ABC often tackles that because we see ourselves as a cultural organisation today and they, every now and then when there's some fear that funding's going to be cut because our ability to raise funds is fairly limited through ABC shops. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so they, what the ABC does is run the, the scare campaign yeah. and simply ask the question, uh, would you notice it if it wasn't there? Yeah. Um, and the power of that question yeah. is apparently quite shocking in Canberra. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's a joke in News Limited, uh, who has a very unique view of the ABC, uh, <laughs> has a, we know that inside News Limited there's an editorial policy, if things are quiet, run an article on the ABC, <laughs> and you wake the audience up. Um, now that's cultural power, but it's very hard to make that power work for us in any other one sort of blunt instrument. Uh, can I come back Please. a little bit on this question and take this one again? And, um, there's a way in which we often want to frame issues in the public sector, which is uh, it's a resource allocation decision. Mm. We've got a limited mm. amount of public limited. dollars. Are we going to spend it on supporting the auto industry? Are we going to support it on, um, uh, you know, on the arts? And then we try to answer that question by getting improved measurement systems that uh, allow us to estimate the effect of the public programs and then to find a common way of monetizing them so we can see what their rate of return is on each of these things so that we can get an improved um, you know, allocation of resources among those different activities and stuff. And uh, I bought into that for maybe 20 years of my life. I thought that was the right way to go. And the more I've worked in the public sector, the more I've realized that the public sector is really bad at allocating resources among different activities. It's terrible at that. It doesn't know how to do it. It doesn't have any uh, discipline in doing it, you know, it's a blah, blah, blah. But what the public sector organization can be really good at is improving its performance in any particular place that it's investing its money, all right? So that there's one notion about how a government should try to increase public value, and mm -hmm. it's getting the allocation right across different activities, all right? And that's an important thing. But by far the more important thing is to take every particular thing that we're doing and make it perform better, mm -hmm. all right? And I think that if we went in that model, about, again, it's this thing about, oh my goodness, we love this drama about, well, which, you know, are we really artists or industrialists at heart and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. I, I just look at it and I say to myself, well, you know, we probably got the, uh, we got money allocated in a particular way. I wonder if I could get an improved performance out of every single piece of that sector, mm -hmm. right, or of the, of the money that I'm currently spending. And it seems to me like that's the problem that faces the board of TPAC and other people is, yeah, okay, you can have a big fight about whether you've got the right amount of money, but whatever you got. <laughs> Make it work. 
let's figure out a way to make it better, right? And, uh, and get more of the value that we're interested in. And so keep our mind, and certainly I, I don't say that because I think that you'll be rewarded <laughs> that if you do a great job, I don't necessarily think it's true that you get more money, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. I just think that might as well not worry about whether you're gonna get more money. Let it fall on your head uh, one way or the other and concentrate on trying to produce as much with whatever comes your way. I've only got a couple of minutes left. A final question coming on Twitter from Anna McGee who says, there's a, a difference between program policy effectiveness and uh, creating yeah. value. Yeah. Can you explore this? Does someone want to address that briefly? I want to hear what Mark's got to say. <laughs> <laughs> So this is actually a big deal. Um, and uh, the answer is there's a certain relationship between program and policy effectiveness and creating value in the same way that there's a certain relationship between what you might describe as mission effectiveness of an organization and creating value, all right? But the important difference uh, is this, um, it's kind of a, I don't know whether, it's kind of a technical question in some ways, but. So is it mission, mi mission versus vision? Uh, no, I wouldn't go there because the vision is one of the things that starts carrying you into this world of uh, the story rather than the measure, and I don't want to okay. let those things go. The big here, the program versus policy in the first instance is a challenge between an organization and its performance as a whole versus the performance of a unit of analysis yeah. called a policy or a program, right? And the relationship between a policy and a program on the one hand and an organization on the other is problematic. Uh, an organization can be viewed as a bunch of policies and programs, sort of like product lines in mm. a business, right? Or a policy could be seen as taking up lots of different activities from different organizations and adding them up into some problem-solving effort. So the first question here, is the unit of analysis a policy or a program or is a unit of analysis an organization, right? And I think for, and we have to be able to move back and forth between those two units of analysis but know what we're doing. So that's the first point. Second, more important point, it seems to me, is that this question about program and policy effectiveness in the social science community has been appropriated by uh, people who do program evaluation, right? Mm -hmm. And the great virtue of program evaluation is that it does ask government managers to say what it is that is valuable and what it is that they're doing. Now, what's interesting about that is that if you ask the program evaluators how they know the answer to that, <laughs> right, before they go out and try to measure the size of the effect, right? They don't actually have a very good answer to that question, yeah. right? And what they typically go to then is, well, we'll go back in the legislative history and see what argumentation was made in the legislative history for the production of this report. Yeah. And then we'll try to write down each of those things and then evaluate whether we got the results that the people said was the intention, yeah. right? Yeah. Now that's fine, right? Um, and, but what's interesting about it is that when you go back to figure out what you mean by effectiveness or of a policy or program, you have to go back to a political statement as to value, right, mm -hmm. that is contained in the legislative hearing that says there's this problem and we'd like to solve it and here's the best way to solve it and here's the money and the authority to go get the job done. And it's only after you get that political frame that you can go out and begin uh, doing the program evaluation. So this idea that there's effectiveness as a neutral term without there being yeah. a political base behind it is false, right? Then the next, and then there's the possibility that, well, maybe we want to change our minds. <laughs> maybe we began with the purposes one, two, and three, and then lo and behold, we discovered this effect over here that was either negative or positive, and now we want to change our mind. So now we have to reconstruct the accounting system to measure that new effect, not just the ones that we had in mind at the outset, right? And it's that dialogue that goes on, is, that is a dialogue around the effects and whether we're going to value them or not, that of a particular policy. The last issue, though, turns out to be the social scientists then, when they talk about program and policy effectiveness, want to load in this heavy burden of causal attribution, all right? They want to be sure that the effect that was produced, or seems to have been produced by the program, we move the needle on objectives A, B, and C, we want to make sure that those effects came from this particular uh, policy intervention we made and not something else, <laughs> right? Because it's likely to be in the Q1 journal. Right. If they do. It's an academic <laughs> thing. And so they load this heavy burden of uh, <coughs> experimentation and program and design onto the program. And that uh, means that you can't do it very often, <laughs> right? Uh, so that we don't actually run organizations in the government by doing serious program uh, and policy evaluations, mm -hmm. right? That covers only a tiny little bit of what we're doing, right? And I keep thinking, you know, nobody asks business to do that, 
right? Uh, if, you know, if you do, you're running a business and you produce a profit, nobody says, are you sure that it was your marketing operation and your product <laughs> engineers that produced that effect? And it say, I don't know. I, mean, I kind of like to think that was true, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to prove to anybody that that's the case. All I have to do is point to the increased sales, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So the interesting question is, is why wouldn't that be the right place again to start in the government is with essentially an accounting system that says, here's the needle I want to move. <laughs> and let's start with the question about whether I've got a good measure of uh, a good needle and whether I'm moving in the right direction. And then take up the question later about whether there's something I can do to uh, and move the needle even further in a variety of different things like that. So, but, uh, um, Mark, this notion of discreetly being able to objectively um, claim that you, you know, in tourism, that somebody came to your festival and they came only for your festival, yeah. but they didn't come to do anything else in the city, just yeah. seems to me a complete madness, yeah. you know. Well, but, you know, but that's what it's, it's okay because we, you know, we like to be hard on the public sector and make sure <laughs> that we don't give them any extra credit because uh, that would be a big mistake. They'd get all inflated and gross. You know, I mean, to, to continue to be ignorant of that of that critical difference is to me just brings up the old adage of knowing the price of everything but the value of nothing. Mm. I mean, that's that's the mm. outcome from mm. it all. So. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Mark Moore, Judith McLean, and Jeff Wilcox. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, everybody, um, for the next hour or so, Mark, Judith, Steve and Jeff are going to be downstairs um, having a drink. So you're most welcome to come down. If you couldn't ask them a question publicly, you're most welcome to accost them in a soft way, um, face to face. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.